Good, excellent. So let's begin. We're very happy to have uh, Kristen here from Victoria University, University of Victoria, who will be telling us about uh, Korean War Homes in ADSCFT. So Kristen, take it away. All right, well, thank you very much for the kind invitation. It'd be, of course, nicer to see you all in the flesh, but say la vie. Um, this talk is based on a couple of papers that appeared on Archive last year with Jordan Kotler, who's now junior society at uh, Harvard, and then a paper that should be out, well, pretty soon here. We're, we're, we're finishing it up, and hopefully I'll get to it by the end. Um, right, so I want to begin with uh, an old question. You'll see why I'm going to start with this question uh, soon enough. You know, in, in field theory, we're used to the mantra that, well, and we define theories with a functional integral. Well, we sum over everything that's consistent with boundary conditions. We sum over all possible field configurations that are, are consistent. And of course, it's a, it's a question in consistent theories of quantum gravity, really meaning string theories, whether or not we also do this in the target space. You know, at, at a basic level, do we sum over all topologies? Are there additional non-geometric contributions to the, the target space path integral and so on. And in other words, you know, what really is the integration contour in string theory, you know, from the target space point of view? And the, the, this is a question that's above my pay grade. I'm gonna make some progress on, on bits of it. Um, I think myself and many other people <laughs> sort of preaching to the choir with this audience, have taken the attitude that, you know, we should really take supergravity as an effective field theory very seriously, um, meaning that we sum over configurations, we sum over all possible things consistent with boundary conditions and treat that as a good working assumption until proven otherwise. There are, have been many successes with this approach, which, you know, I, I could spend the whole time talking about it. Um, I want to mention a couple that are fairly recent and fashionable <laughs> that, uh, that, that go beyond, for instance, um, you know, counting uh, ge smooth geometries that with fixed asymptotics, say. Um, so one of these fashionable things of late has been the study of a two-dimensional toy model of quantum gravity called jaki teitelblom gravity. One reason why you might study it is it universally arises as low energy description of near extremal black holes in string theory with ADS2 near horizon. So it's a 2D theory. It's a theory of so-called dilaton gravity. And it's a theory that has recently been shown to be a consistent theory of quantum gravity, meaning you, know, you can study it on arbitrary genus and the various moduli space integrals uh, make sense, are convergent and so on, on spaces of arbitrary genus. Um, this model lives in asymptotically anti visitor space at times. So there's, you know, one might expect that it's dual to, to something. And indeed, it is dual to something. It's dual to something called a, um, a random matrix theory, a, a so-called double-scaled random matrix theory, a theory of very large n by n Hermitian matrices, which you can think of as instances of quantum mechanical Hamiltonians. And in this model, there's a dictionary whereby, you know, if you do kind of the usual thing that you're used to in ADS, you anchor down some boundary. Here it's ADS2, so the boundary is one-dimensional with some length, let's call it beta. Um, so you anchor down some circle asymptotically of size beta. Well, and you, you sum over everything that's related in the matrix model to studying Tracy to the minus beta h and then averaging over matrices h with a particular distribution. And in space time, that corresponds to, well, you know, you include the hyperbolic disk. <laughs> you know, you include uh, a genus one surface with a bound circle boundary, a genus two surface with a circle boundary, and so on and so forth. And so here, they're, they're not only is the theory consistent on these higher genus spaces, like world sheet string theory, but the, the duality instructs you to sum over all of those surfaces. That's one piece of one recent success. 
Um, there's another that has been all the rage with uh, a certain community of people. Um, the study of certain simple models of uh, unitary black hole evaporation. Words associated with these are replica wormholes uh, coming from a couple of papers from the end of 2019 with many authors. Um, the sort of simple models here were essentially uh, building off of JT gravity coupled to some extra system, two-dimensional conformal field theory at large central charge. And what these authors did here was they computed the page curve for you know, sort of the entropy of Hawking radiation um, as a function of time, sort of as you collect more and more Hawking quanta that are emitted from this black hole in this very simple stripped down model. And in this case, the, 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 the curve that you get has, well, sort of two lines, both of which are well-described semi-classically. The, the one here is sort of analog of Hawking's original computation. You look at sort of um, probe physics on top of a black hole background. And if that continued forever, at some point that entropy would exceed that of the black hole and well, that can't be. Um, but what happens is, is that some finite time, order the page time, there's a crossover. There's something like a phase transition where a new semi-classical geometry contributes uh, more to this quantity than the, the usual one. And that geometry is a so-called replica wormhole. You compute this entropy using uh, something called replica trick, where you introduce multiple copies of your system. Then, you know, for uh, the, the entropy comes from a delicate continuation as you take the number of copies of your system down to one, but and as an intermediate step, you need control when you have n copies of your system. And say if you had three, well, there are new semi-classical geometries where your sort of black holes, the interior of your black holes are connected smoothly by a geometry that, you know, we would otherwise draw on the, you know, pair of Pansky composition, <laughs> sort of something like this. A connected geometry that connects all these uh, different regions together. And this, it's geometries of these sort that are the so-called replica wormholes. And they're the ones that, again, in the context of these very simple models, save unitary evaporation. Just I have a stupid question. Uh, one thing I, you know, I looked through these papers a long, long, you know, a few several months back. Did they ever actually calculate the time at which the crossover occurs? Because they're always working in the Euclidean section, and they never really honestly do a, an analytic continuation. So I couldn't right. find an estimate of, uh, anywhere of the crossover time or how the crossover happens. I, you know, I mean, there's an. It, except for the argument at the end of the day, if you want to recover information, one instanton has to dominate. Yeah. Over the but did they actually compute at any point in this whole discussion? I, I mean, I, I can look through the papers. I don't recall seeing it either. Um, but the, how to say, the expressions for, you know, the time-dependent entropy that you would get from one saddle and the time-dependent entropy that you get from the replica wormhole are both there. So then there's just a question of, you know, which one, you know, there's a point where the two are equal and that's the time that you're interested in. It's parametrically of order the page time. I don't remember the precise coefficient. Yeah, no, it's more criticism of the sort of, I mean, there's an instant on there, and the, but there's no, that paper, the paper contains essentially no dynamics. It says, here's an instant on, here's another right. instant on, and it should cross over at some point. But they mutter about Euclidean, uh, Lorentzian extensions, but I just, I hadn't been following in the last few months. Um, sure, sure, no yeah. Dynamical Lorentzian Comp the well, the, the, the thing is, is that they're, I mean, the, the statement is, is that the thing that they're computing, the sort of generalized notion of entropy at, say, fixed time, is computable by a Euclidean computation. So what they, it's not that, how to say, you know, there, there's some, there's some business about what these, uh, what the, if you wanted to do a purely Lorentzian version of this computation, then there's some mumbling. But as far as the status of the Euclidean computation goes, that gets this, that gets this entropy, that I, I think is, is pretty well, that's on a pretty good footing. No, I, I know there's a subtle point there and it gives some kind of a description of this generalized entropy, which sort of yeah. is, 
you know, I, you know, I don't want to get into an examination of this because the generalized entropy, in my perspective, redefines the goalpost by redefining the entropy of the outside that involves yes. the inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so it's it, it's an interesting calculation, but I, you know, the, the dynamics of this process are, are completely oh, opaque. I mean, yes, there's there's many things to be said about. I I agree. I don't want to relitigate that. You, know, you, should, you should keep going, but I just uh, yeah, I sympathize with the outlook. I, I'm including it here more as a as a placeholder to say, you know, that the sort the the sort of mechanism that underlies this is the inclusion of of gravitational instantons, and well, that that gives some good reason to. I mean, if you weren't already taking them seriously, again, this is a silly thing to say to this group, perhaps, but. If you weren't taking them seriously, maybe you should take them seriously. Um, what I wanted to say next, though, is more in the vein of, of where this talk is going. You know, the, mm, there is there are some trade-offs to, to doing this. So there is a you know, there, there's sort of a conservation principles that we encounter of life involving conservation of difficulty or suffering or something. But not everything uh, you know you you make you solve one problem only to lead to another. Um, and there's a problem that we run into as a result of including wormholes like this in, uh, in, in quantum gravity that has, is, has recently been dubbed the factorization paradox. And the first place where it, it's very clearly discussed is in a nice paper of Madhusena and Maus from 2004. They don't call it a factorization paradox. Um, that, that name has kind of emerged uh, communally later. Um, but they were the first ones to discuss the problem cleanly. And the problem is this. So imagine that we look at, but I, I have in mind here all now Euclidean ADS CFT, uh, some consistent theory of Euclidean quantum gravity, type 2D string theory, say, on ADS5 times S5, uh, dual to a conformal field theory. Now, in the usual dictionary, if we sum over geometries that asymptote to you know, some boundary conditions so with, that would say, oh, well, my CFT is living on a space, so I'll call it M with sources, blah, blah, blah. Well, what is that dual to? Well, that's dual to, you know, you anchor down boundary conditions at the, the edge of anti de Sitter, and you sum over every possible way of filling that in. I'm drawing that here kind of in the, the way that we draw blobs, for instance, and in, uh, to represent all possible pro processes that can take place in a nest matrix computation. That's all fine. The problem is what happens with the two boundary problem? In quantum gravity, we can study an analogous problem where instead of just having one boundary, we have two with data called M1 and M2 on the two boundaries. And again, we can ask in principle, you know, what are all possible ways of filling those two boundaries in and perform that sum in principle. And the naive ADS dictionary would tell you, well, the output of that sum would be the dual partition function on the union of these two disjoint spaces, M1 union M2. Now the set of Geometries that fills in two boundaries is going to include stuff where, you know, left side is disconnected from right side, and then also things that connect the two. This is where Euclidean wormholes appear. They, those would be the, the contributions that connect these two distant asymptotic regions of space time. Now, this is a problem because, on the one hand, you would say, you know, that the, two, the, the gravity problem on the with the two boundaries, you would be want to say that that's the, the CFT partition function on disjoint union M1, M2. Um, but that should be equal then the disconnected contributions. You would say this is the CFT partition function on M1. This is the partition function on M2. That's how you get this. Um, plus contributions from wormholes. And the problem is, is that in conformal field theory, the partition function factorizes by virtue of locality. So in other words, the left-hand side is exactly equal to CFT on M1, CFT on M2. Which case, 
case clone, what gives? Do all these connected things add up to zero or is there more going on? This is a question. This is the, the, the statement of the factorization paradox. Is that naively, you would include a sum over connected geometries as well as the disconnected ones, but um, the connected ones potentially spoil factorization of the dual control field theory. So the question that I have in mind today is, you know, do these Euclidean wormholes really contribute in string theory or not? And, you know, if we can find some reason to think that they do, one can ask a follow-up, which, I mean, at some level kind of punts the, the paradox, but maybe what actually happens, you know, there are there also additional stringy non-geometric contributions in this problem that arise only when we have multiple boundaries, which also contribute in addition to the space-time geometries, the wormholes, in such a way that you maintain factorization. Now, there is some data. This is all kind of experimental theoretical physics. And I think we're, we're, we're reaching around trying to figure out what the story is here. There is some data to draw upon. It's worth mentioning. The first is that, you know, that there's, especially in the 80s, around the time that I was born, there was a, a small industry of folks trying to find Euclidean wormholes in string, in string theory and supergravity, owing, uh, inspired by work of Coleman on this subject. So there's this whole study of axion wormholes by Giddings, Strominger, Kuczynski, et cetera. Um, it's a fun fact that those things are universally uh, perturbatively unstable. So you know they are formally saddle point solutions in string theory, but they're unstable. So their status is, you, know, you probably shouldn't include them. Um, however, in, in, the last, uh, in the last couple of decades, there's been some new ones uh, that are-, are Sorry, are, silly question. Are we talking Euclidean wormholes or Lorentzian wormholes now? Euclidean wormholes. So, okay. So why weren't these questions asked of the instant on we just discussed, which is the one that supposedly helps JT gravity work? Um, so that one, uh, right. So are you asking if, well- If they're perturbatively stable, or are they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that one is perturbative. The one that I, I drew above is perturbatively stable. Okay. But these aren't. So can you give me an intuition as to why these ones aren't and aren't perturbatively stable, whereas the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the axions, so if you want... Um, so in that case, right, it's, it's the question of, you know, what's yeah. puffing up the wormhole? You know, wormholes want to collapse in <clears> gravity. <throat> and want yep. to pinch off between distant regions. Sure. So you need something that puffs it up. And in the setting before, the thing that's puffing it up is essentially some, some conformal field theory with large central charge of order one over G Newton that's coupled to the gravity in such a way that um, the, 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 like, the, the, uh, you know, the stress tensor of the CFT that you get from the conformal anomaly is, is big enough to, to keep the wormhole puffed up and stable. How, how does gravity know about that? You mean through the through the scalar of the Jakeef Teitelbaum gravity, it has some weird property that pop enables that to happen? Uh, well, uh, no, no, it's, um, it, there's uh, the, the scalar, its only role in, in JT is to enforce a constant curvature constraint. What, okay, what happens, so what happens, it, it just arises from the, uh, you know, if you imagine integrating out the CFT that renormalizes the gravitational effective action it, in a way that in their model, there's no direct coupling to the dilaton. Okay. The, so the, you just then, get a stress tensor. How, so then how does gravity know about any of this CFT stuff? Is it because there's a cosmological constant that's being thrown in? Um, try, trying to think about yeah. this entirely in terms of perturbative gravity. So an answer in terms of CFT is not a good one from that perspective. That, that's right. Yeah, that's not the, that, that's right. So um, there's a constant curvature that's there uh, that's enforced by the dilaton. But what the, at a technical level, what you need to stabilize the replica wormhole is for there to also be a consistent dilaton profile on top of these geometries. And the funny thing about JT is that the, the Einstein's equations that you get from varying with respect to metric have like derivatives of dilaton on left-hand side. Mm -hmm. And then you get an extra contribution here coming from the CFT on the right-hand side. And it's that extra contribution from 
from CIT that allows you to, to stabilize the diloton. So what I'm hearing in terms of gravity is it's boundary conditions that stabilize it. Um, there, no, there's a local coupling as well because you have uh, the, the model at hand for the replicant wormholes is JT gravity coupled to ah. two-dimensional conformal field theory. Okay. On the boundary though. No, no, no. Okay, no, no, okay. It's, I mean, it's, it's the dilaton gravity is a 2D model and it's, it's actually coupled to a 2D large yeah, okay. CFT. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's not just on the boundary. Sure. Yeah, Nick, I think you're mixing up uh, the, the dual CFT Yes. Uh, a la ADS CFT uh, um, that the Dilaton gravity has to actually explicitly coupling, coupling it in the bulk. Uh, Good. To, okay, to a CFT. Good. Which, which Good. is essentially the heat bath that the black hole radiates to. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Good. But I, I have a, I have a, a question, Christian, before you continue. Uh, and I'm sort of playing devil's advocate here. Um, but um, I, I want to ask a question. Why is the presence of wormholes, as you described, uh, uh, previously, why is that presence of wormholes considered to be uh, a problem and a paradox as opposed to a prediction? This is how quantum gravity works and we've learned something new, hurrah. Although, yes, okay. there are some of us who would argue we learned this 30 years ago, but. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, okay, so uh, I can see how the time evolution is working out here. There's no way I'll get to. <laughs> I have far too much that than I can get to. Um, if I was able to get to the end, then <laughs> you would see that. So in some, in some other consistent history, um, I would actually take that perspective. Okay, good. I, I'm actually what I my, the the strategy here. I'm trying to give a fairly long pedagogical introduction here, where right. I was actually going to say, you know, there there. This is the next point here, kind of in two that there, you know, the the attitude towards the these wormholes. 15 years ago, 20 years ago, was that they were bad. <laughs> we should find reasons to exclude them and reject them. And it's nothing that we knew of that they were good for. But I would say in the last few years, as a result of some of this work in, in low gravity, we now know some things that they're good for. And they're, they have some nice relation to black hole microstates, as I'm gonna explain. And so I, my attitude is, I mean, if we abandon our theoretical prejudices and say, well, if we maintain the, the dictum that we sum over everything consistent with boundary conditions until proven that that's the wrong thing to do, then, well, we should include them anyway. And then along the way, we find that they, they seem to include new physics. And then from, there is a question about factorization, but to my mind, that, that's potentially a very sensitive, non-perturbative question in string theory that you know, th this would be a question that's accessible in effective field theory, but that one would not. Good. That's where we're going. So um, I think in view of the, that you want to get on, um, uh, uh, carry on, uh, but do, do bear in mind that if you, if, if in the interest of having a great discussion, we don't get to some of the material that you want to present, you are invited to give a part two uh, 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 you know, at any at any point, we can we can we can. Okay. Well, I, I don't want to. Yeah, yes. let, let's cross that bridge when we get there. Uh, yeah. So, you guys so just, decide it, amongst yourselves based on how you think to talk. What? Oh, yeah. you so just, go, go go at whatever pace you're comfortable with to have a great discussion, and and uh, don't worry. You know, just don't worry. Right, so we write a vote of confidence and say, uh, this is uh, it's a nice to have this pedagogical introduction. So don't cut short that. Okay. Okay. So I, I would, the thing that goes, so you asked Nick a minute ago about the axions, the thing that goes wrong for the axions, um, how to say, what is the axion wormhole? You have some, um, some axions in the Euclidean gravity with like a wrong sign kinetic term in Euclidean signature. And what happens, the axion wormholes are supported by a gradient of the axion. That's the thing that, that gives you the, the stress tensor, the matter stress tensor to pop up the wormhole. But then the thing is, is that uh, because they have a gradient, um, well, uh, this was a very nice paper of Hertog, Van Riet, and, oh gosh, I'm forgetting the third author. <laughs> this was a couple of years ago, where they show that these wormholes are, they're stable in the S wave, but they're unstable to spatially inhomogeneous uh, perturbations along the direction of the gradient. In fact, there's infinitely many such instabilities. So 
it's it's like Gregory Laflamme, but worse. <laughs> there's there's infinitely many modes that are unstable. Um, how more recently there have been some new wormholes that have been found that are perturbatively stable, though. And these are are uh, maybe sharpen our, our questions a bit about whether or not these things should should appear in string theory or not. Um, one class was noted by Maldesain and Miles in their paper. Basically, you just take a suitable orbifold of hyperbolic of the hyperbolic three ball, um, such that, well, the 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 geometry, the um, you, you consider orbifolds such that the the wormhole smooth connects two higher genus surfaces of the same genus, but genus bigger than or equal to two. And then the S3 and you know either T4 or K3 just come along for the ride. So this gives you some wormholes in D, the context of D1, D5. Um, those are perturbatively, you know, for, depending on where you are in the T4 moduli space, this thing is uh, perturbatively stable. However, you know, it, it should be noted it's not clear whether or not the D1, D5 CFT really exists or not on higher genus surfaces. There's some reason to think that it doesn't, uh, going back to work of Cyberg and Witten, in which case the status of this, I would say, is a bit more uh, uncertain. Um, very recently, as in last month, uh, there was a paper of Meroff and Santos, though, which uh, found some, some new wormholes in, you know, for instance, in 11D supergravity, where the boundary is positively curved rather than negatively curved. And there's uh, basically some, um, some gauge background on top of the wormhole that supports it. And these, they claim, I have not had a chance to verify their computation for myself, they claim that these things are perturbatively stable. The point of this data point is to say that, you know, um, it's hard to find these wormholes, especially stable ones, but they, there does seem to be some number of them that actually do exist and sharpens the question whether or not we should include them. But the other point that I would say I, I, I really have more in mind is the second one. It's this thing that I was saying to Clifford a little bit ago. You know, maybe rather than finding a way to ban them from life, maybe they actually are good for something. <laughs> um, I said above that in JT gravity, we're really instructed to sum over everything. That includes the wormholes, in fact. And perhaps th there's, there's some strong evidence, I would say, from a paper I wrote with Jordan last year, that this is also true in pure three-dimensional quantum gravity with negative cosmological constant. But in the interest of, of, uh, of, of kind of sticking to something that's been shown uh, that where the story has been written, basically, let's stick to JT. In JT, the leading contribution to the two boundary problem is something like what I've drawn here, where there's two boundary circles and then a cylinder, a hyperbolic cylinder that connects them. And the dictionary between JT and matrix model, what this does is this relates, um, the, the dictionary relates that wormhole amplitude to the two-point function of Tracy the minus beta h. And when I say two-point function, I mean, you know, under the, the random matrix average. So you set up Tracy the minus beta 1h, Tracy the minus beta 2h, and then average over Hamiltonians, consider the connected part. And to get approximation, that is this wormhole amplitude on the left. What's it good for? Well, if you conduct the inverse Laplace transform, so as to look at the two-point function of eigenvalue densities in the matrix model that you obtain from this, it possesses this form that I write here on the right-hand side. Don't worry about the one over two pi squared. The important thing is this E1 minus E2 squared. This is something that's called eigenvalue repulsion, which is uh, a universal result in random matrix theory. And it is a, um, it's, it's a nearly universal feature of many quantum mechanical systems with a large number of degrees of freedom. It's the statement ultimately that nearby energy eigenstates generally repel and are usually separated from each other by some small amount. So in this case, the, the two-point function is negative. It's decrease, it's increasing as the energies get close. It's saying that energies want to not get too close to each other. And 
can say there's some similar, this, the thing that Jordan and I did, we found, we were able to compute this corresponding amplitude uh, in ADS3, where the boundary was a torus rather than a circle. And you see very similar physics if you decompose it in the right way. You see exactly the physics of eigenvalue propulsion. Raises the question. Well, OK. Now, this random matrix theory answer, you, you might wonder if that's, you know, what, what should you make of it? What I'd like to, to argue now is that that answer is getting at something very, very non-trivial about not just large matrices, but generic many-body quantum systems. It's getting something right. Go with me here for a minute. So consider a 2D CFT like you know, D1, D5 with a holographic dual, so large central charge. If we consider the spectrum of, you know, just to write it on a 2D plot instead of a 3D plot, the spectrum of spinless primaries in such a theory, it's gonna look something like this. Um, there's the vacuum that's sitting there, a nice delta function spike at minus C over 12. There's gonna be a bunch of more delta function spikes at a variety of dimensions, conformal dimensions that increase. Um, those would be in gravity coming from, you know, light states, so supergravity excitations, strings, brains even, and so on. And then something very special happens at a conformal dimension, well, it, it, or a, how to say, a, an energy here. This is, sorry, this is not conformal dimension. This is really uh, energy with respect to the Hamiltonian on a circle. Um, something very special happens once the energy hits um, of order minus the 12, order one, basically. That is to say, for conformal dimensions that are order C over 12. And the special thing that happens is that you get an approximate continuum, a very large number of, uh, of approximately continuous black hole microstates. And if you were to estimate that spectrum from gravity, you would say, oh, well, you know, it looks approximately continuous because that's what BTZ thermodynamics tells you. Of course, in a microscopic thing like D1, D5, at some point in moduli space, you would say, well, it's, it's, an, it's a discrete spectrum. It's just that there's an enormous number of non-BPS states where their level spacings, the distance between nearby energy eigenstates is e to the minus c, which is, you know, you can't see that in perturbative quantum gravity, in perturbative string theory. It's invisible from the point of view of the bulk. But, you know, um, what is gravity doing? Well, what it's doing is, is it's uh, a, you know, coarse grain over that scale. If you were to coarse grain over scales of order e to the minus c, well, then this very, very fine large number of discrete states in the black hole regime would look like a continuum, this Cardi-like density of states that you get from BTZ. Um, but really, you know, it's, it's coming from a large number of discrete set states. Well, if we were talking about a generic many-body quantum mechanics, we would expect there to be um, repulsion between those different energy levels. If we think of them as uh, energy eigenstates of CFT Hamiltonian on a circle, we would expect there to be some repulsion whereby those states, they don't all want to lie on top of each other. They want to be very near each other. That repulsion in a single CFT would be characterized by nearest neighbor level statistics. You, you know, you compute the difference in energies and you look at the statistics of those differences. Um, those level statistics are, and this is something condensed matter theorists have much more experience than we do. They're nearly universal for a wide range of systems, except those that um, exhibit what's called many body localization. And if you coarse grain again, the level statistics over scales of order the order e to the minus c, that the repulsion is it, it it is this thing that I wrote above, or at least the minus sign part and the e1 minus e2 squared part. The other factors are, you know, they, they might be specific to random matrix theory, but the, the key features of this are generic in many body quantum systems. So in other words, but in JT and ADS3, you know, Euclidean black holes, 
surrogate for something. They give a coarse grain approximation to the dual density of states. And the Euclidean wormholes are good for something too. They give a coarse grained approximation to the fluctuation statistics of black hole microstates in those models. Raises the question, well, what about higher dimensional ADS CFT and supergravity? <laughs> are they, are, you know, can we find these the wormholes like this in higher dimensional quantum gravity? And are they good for something there as well? I have a note here about factorization. You might say, well, you let in by telling us that things should factorize. Well, the, the comment here is simply that um, I said that JT is dual to an ensemble. It's dual to an average over quantum mechanical Hamiltonians rather than a single instance. And so what happens in that case is that the two boundary problem computes an average of two partition, a two point function in this ensemble, which if the ensemble is not trivial, will not be you know, one point function squared. So the fact that, well, how to say, there's no factors, the, everything I've said is consistent with fact questions of factorization in those simple models. That was my very long introduction, went longer than I expected, my apologies. Um, it's 10.40, so Pacific time, something different in Paris time. So let me, uh, I'll try to focus, I think, um, on how we get, so I'm gonna showcase, you know, how do we get some wormholes like this, like these ones in JT and ADS-3 in ordinary Einstein gravity. And then the part that I probably will not get to talk about is uh, how to embed those wormholes into type 2D string theory, ADS-5 times S5. But you'll get the phenomenology of them more or less right from, uh, from this next section of the talk. Okay, so for the, the you know, we could make this more complicated, but to make things relatively simple, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to be interested in Euclidean wormholes where the boundaries of space have exactly the same topology as we're used to for Euclidean black holes. So meaning if we were like in ADS3, S1 times S1, if we're in ADS5, um, this should be uh, S1 times S3. We could also study toroidal uh, cases as well. Um, and I don't want to turn on anything else. I just want to, I don't want to turn on any matter fields. I don't want to turn on any gauge backgrounds. I'm just interested in pure gravity um, because, you know, ultimately I'm interested in, say, the spectral statistics of black hole microstates in, you know, ADS5 times S5 with no other quantum numbers, just the, say, the new, completely neutral black hole microstates. Now, there's a theorem due to Witten and Yao, the Yao of Kalabi Yao, um, that tells you that, well, if I'm interested in this kind of problem where the boundary has positive curvature and where nothing else is turned on, that there simply are no solutions to the Einstein's equations with cosmological constant of this sort. So if I'm interested in this problem, I am necessarily interested in off-shell physics which is why I led in with the, this, this comments about, you know, what really are we doing with summing over metrics and string theory? Now, normally the question, well, <laughs> let's try and, and, and sum up things that are off shell, completely off shell, always off shell without any um, classical point to expand around. Usually that's a hopeless enterprise and you give up and do something else with your life. Um, but there's some reason in, in, in this endeavor to not just give up, but to really you know, you know, push this. And there's some historical, um, well, okay, yeah. So let me review a story that maybe uh, you've not heard of before, it was new to me, of something called constrained instantons that go back to papers of Affleck and then also Affleck, Dine, and Seiberg in the early 80s. As an example, consider SU2 Yang Mills theory in four dimension coupled to a Higgs field. This model has a confined phase, and there's instantons in the confined phase, the usual uh, BPSC instantons. However, in the Higgs phase of the model, there are no instanton solutions whatsoever. 
you just prove that there are no instanton solutions to the field equations with finite energy and that respect the, the right boundary conditions at infinity. However, it's not the case that, you know, there's just no non-perturbative instanton corrections in the Higgs phase. Um, you know, it's not like you suddenly lose non-perturbative corrections. What happens instead is something more delicate. Um, what happens is that, you know, sort of morally, you would expect that, well, if you're in the Higgs phase, that's characterized by some scale. And as long as you look at instantons with size that's smaller than that scale, well, those should be approximate instantons of the, the theory in the Higgs space. Instantons, recall, are characterized by a size modulus. It's an exact zero mode of the, the field equations of yang mills that's guaranteed by tree-level scale symmetry. Um, but what happens is, is that in the Higgs space, this modulus becomes a pseudo-modulus. It's, you know, in other words, the action, if you were to consider a small instanton with a small size that's small compared to the Higgs scale, so that's approximately a solution to the field equations. Well, its action, it, it depends on its size. And in particular, its action, you know, this can be made very systematic, is, is of order what I wrote here. The usual instanton action, eight pi squared over G yang mil squared, plus terms that are of order psi squared times Higgs vep squared. So what happens is, is that the, the instanton size becomes a pseudo modulus, a variable, and the, say the one instanton amplitude is something that involves an integral over the size modulus where you integrate e to the minus action of the instanton weighted by an appropriate measure. We wrote one of this there, but you know, okay. Because the action is constant plus order psi squared, um, if you were to ask, well, does this instanton amplitude have a saddle point approximation, you would learn it doesn't. The size wants to run off to zero. This integral is dominated by contributions from very, very small instantons. And well, you know, those are singular configurations. Um, but in any case, there's no saddle point approximation in the size of the instanton. But you still have computational control. That's the thing I want to stress, I guess, is that even though this is off-shell physics, these are instanton, these are near instantons, they're, they're non-perturbative configurations, but they are, you know, that they're not exactly saddles of the field equations. You can still make sense of the sum over them in a semi-classical expansion. And we can hope to adapt that procedure in quantum gravity. Now, where did this come from, the, the, these expressions that I wrote? Well, the idea is the, as follows. So if you start with the, the, the path integral for SU2 coupled to Higgs, you have something like, uh, like, like this. And what you do from here is you insert a resolution of the identity, this thing in the blue. You basically uh, insert an integral over, uh, a, you introduce a delta function, that's the integral over lambda of this. Um, but then you integrate over this parameter zeta that I've introduced in such a way to cancel it out and always get one. This resolution of the identity depends on a functional that I'm calling C for constraint. That's a functional of the quantum fields. And what, what I mean, what's really happening here is, is basically you're, you're, you're taking your field space of the model and you're labeling it by hypersurfaces of some constraint equals constant, but then you just integrate over all possible such values. And that just amounts to integration over the whole space that you started with. However, if you pick this constraint to be something, and it doesn't, the details actually don't matter too much here. If you, if you pick a generic constraint that's sort of rotationally invariant, say, um, consistent with symmetries that you want to preserve when you find these configurations, say you take it to just be integral of the, the Higgs field to some power. Well, something that you can do, a strategy that you can take for doing the whole functional integral is to say, look, um, we have an integral over gauge quantum fields. 
as well as over these new parameters that we introduced. There's lambda is like a Lagrange multiplier, and zeta is the value of the constraint. Let's integrate over the quantum fields and the Lagrange multiplier first, and we're just going to save the constraint for the very end of the day. So we assume that the functional integrals commute. Um, and we try to, to integrate the thing at fixed value of constraint first. And the thing is, what, what happens in the context of, of the constraint instanton story is that the path integral at fixed constraint, the, the whole thing doesn't admit a saddle point approximation, but the thing at fixed constraint does. Indeed, you can systematically solve the constrained problem at, at, at small instanton size. There's like a perturbation theory that develops. And you can find the, the constrained instantons that um, I, I sort of uh, alluded to above um, and where the constraint parameter basically gets mapped to the size of the instanton. So you can think of the integral over constraint as being an integral over instanton size. And the output from this is an approximation to, you know, say the one instanton amplitude where you integrate over the, the size of the instanton e to the minus s of the instanton with an appropriate measure that's determined by one loop determinants. This approximation is dominated by small instantons. And it's, it's actually quite a good one because the saddle point approximation at fixed constraint at fixed size is good as the instanton goes to zero. That's the ultraviolet regime. And thanks to ultraviolet uh, asymptotic freedom, perturbation theory is good there. You have some control. Um, and well, there, there's some tricky business with whether or not the integral that I wrote actually converges at small instanton size. Uh, but this can be this can be dealt with. The punchline from this is that there is some some method here, the method of constrained instantons, that leads to, in some sense, the dominant off-shell configurations in this problem where there's no saddle points whatsoever. And the output of it is a new semi-classical approximation where you're integrating over this set of these, uh, these important off-shell configurations. And the thing that you need to do is to include fluctuations very nearby it. I talked about this instance, the kind of historical instance of Yang Mills, but actually the, this method has been used in, in many places over the years uh, without actually you know, calling it out by name. If you wanted to do, for some reason, Louisville theory on a sphere, you know, recall that in Louisville control field theory, the solution for the Louisville scalar, you kind of forces the space to be higher genus. Um, so, but you know, it's a CFT, so it should make sense on the sphere and satisfies all the CFT axioms. If you want to study it on a sphere, you need to do something like this. You basically, you know, you, you can introduce a constraint, integrate all the, do a saddle point approximation or integrate over all configuration satisfying the constraint and then integrate over all possible values of the constraints. You can treat Louisville theory in this case. Um, if you're really dealing with multi-instanton configurations in Yang Mills properly, then you're implicitly doing this thing with constraints. That's what's kind of happening if you introduce struts to, to stabilize instantons, keep them from either running away or from flying into each other. And in fact, even the JT and, and 3D gravity wormhole amplitudes that I mentioned earlier, those are actually, when you, when you dig into the guts of those computations, they're really, it's really done this way that I just said. You introduce some constraints, and then in those cases, there's some additional power um, because the gravity theories are so bloody simple. Um, you, can, you don't have to do a semi-classical approximation. You can just integrate everything. Um, but the, the, the way the computations work is essentially along the, the lines of what I said. There's no saddle point approximation for the wormhole amplitudes, but you can write it in terms of uh, using the constraint in some time calculus. Is that, well, go ahead, Nick. So this nice method that you are explaining to us depends, of course, in the, on the particular constraint function that you choose, right? Yes. And the question is, is, is there a, like a standard procedure for finding a, a useful constraint, or is it more like an art? In it's case? more of an art. 
I'll, although I'm about to summarize a way that is, uh, um, I say, seems to be very natural in ADS, and yeah, it just yeah, it's more in historically, it's been an art. The thing is, is you know, in principle, as long as you do everything right, all you've done is insert one into the path integral. So as long as you do things correctly, it doesn't matter what constraint you use. You should pick one that's operationally useful. I see. So, so the worst, things, worst, the worst thing that can happen is that you choose a constraint and you end up with an integral or some saddle point or something that diverges and you cannot deal with. That's right. Or okay. Or what may happen too is that you know there, there, there's this semi-classical approximation at fixed constraint. For us, the wormholes, the constraint is basically going to be the bottleneck size. And what can happen in in gravity is that you know as uh, there can be problems as the site you can think of the the wormhole amplitude as an integral over the pseudo modulus instead of just all the moduli over, with this bottleneck size, and as it shrinks to zero there's a question of whether or not there's divergences or not in that region of pseudo moduli space. That's, that's what you, that's what the question becomes. Thanks. Um, what I wanted to say, I'm calling these things forced saddles or constrained instantons, because if you will, the, this constraint term, what it's doing, it's, it's like what we do when we teach classical mechanics to, to children. Um, <laughs> we talk about constrained problems. We do it by introducing Lagrange multipliers. The Lagrange multipliers can provide a constraint force that modifies your motion. And what's happening here is similar. This constraint term is providing a constraint force that keep, puffs up an instanton in Yang Mills. It keeps it from collapsing. Or in the case of these wormholes, it, it puffs it up and keeps it from pinching off. And I wanted to say, I wanted to flash this and, you know, whenever we, I think it's instructive to consider finite dimensional integrals of this sort. So here's a, a two dimensional integral. The two parameters here are zeta and y. Zeta is integrated from zero to infinity and this, sorry, should be minus infinity to infinity. And there's some integrand which has a large n parameter in it. I want to imagine developing an approximation at large n. And if you were to stare at this for a couple minutes, you'd realize, well, there's a saddle point in the y direction, just fix y equals zero. But there's no saddle in the zeta direction. The action just always decays. The, 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 this thing right here, it always decays as zeta gets smaller and smaller. And this is analogous to what one encounters in, in basically every problem that we understand with constrained instantons. Um, and, but what you can do, what you can imagine doing, is doing a semi-classical approximation, a large n approximation, to the problem at fixed zeta first, and then leave the integral over zeta for the end. So here I, I, I've written it, you know, if you did the quote unquote two loop approximation to the integral over y, you would get, well, this thing over here. Um, you can evaluate that at large n if you wanted to. You get the thing that I wrote at the bottom. Um, that works pretty well at, at large n. But this approximation, if you start playing around with it, it's kind of like the Sterling's approximation at n equals two. It works a lot better than it has any right to for a wide variety of problems. So for instance, let's take n equals two and this parameter a equals one. If you take the two loop result here and you just numerically integrate that thing over zeta, then you get an answer that I've written here but of course you can just do, I mean, it's a two dimensional integral. So, you know, you can numerically approximate it to as good a precision as you want. Well, you get an answer that <laughs> agrees up to 1%, even when we're, I've normalized, oh, sorry. I've, I've normalized these things and set by their sort of asymptotic values at large n. So these are very far away from the, the very large n approximation, but still somehow the semi-classical approximation is, is working uh, very unreasonably effectively. Um, okay, so we're all, let's see. So 
That's how the method works in field theory. Um, it can be adapted to study wormholes in Einstein gravity with negative cosmological constant. And this is what Jordan Cutler and I did in a short paper in October of last year. Um, there's also a, a nice related paper by Douglas Stanford from August of last year on you know, similar ideas in the context of JT gravity. And the convenient constraint for us, you were asking Felipe what the, uh, you know, what's the inspired constraint? Uh, for us, an inspired constraint was the length of the wormhole, you know, the length between the two boundaries. If, you know, if the space is disconnected, that length is infinity. So if you want to make a wormhole, you can just mandate that it's finite, and that will bring the two ends together. Um, what I wrote here, though, now that I've, I've reached my, my, uh, the, 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 the end of the talk brain is, uh, <laughs> is another way of, of doing the, this apparatus that, of, of finding these wormholes that just relies on machinery that's already there in gravity without introducing a constraint. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll just finish with this. Um, the idea is, is to leverage, you know, when, when we talk about gravity or a gauge theory, you know, the real definition of the quantum theory, of course, involves gauge fixing. And that involves auxiliary fields that can provide forcing, is kind of the idea, in the same way that a constraint term provides forcing. So for instance, if you consider Yang-Mills theory in a delta function gauge, then the total action is the sum of the Yang-Mills term plus gauge fixing term plus ghosts. And what happens is the gauge fixing term actually leads to a source term in the Yang-Mills equations of motion, because it depends on the gauge field. So of course it contributes. And well, you know, at least formally, there are new saddles that you get in Yang-Mills this way, where the, the divergence of the field strength doesn't have to be zero. It can equal something that's kind of puffed up by the auxiliary field. And well, we can do this in gravity. In if for anyone that studied ADS, you know it's it's pretty natural to pick Pfefferman Gram like coordinates, where you know you, you pick kind of like a radial gauge, where the radial component, the metric, is is always fixed to be something, and you set uh, mixed components, radial spatial, to zero. Well, if you do that, then we can find new saddles. And here's an example of such a thing. This is a, this is a wormhole that you can find in any dimensional ADS space. Um, it's a bottleneck geometry. This is, this is the line element. Um, what this does in practice is it solves, I, I fixed a radial gauge, so I'm no longer free to vary the row row component of the metric. And what happens is this metric satisfies all of the Einstein's equations except row row except the thing I'm not allowed to vary anymore because I fixed it to zero. This is formally a solution to the gauge fixed theory with this gauge. And the, in fact, there's actually a, a, a family of these geometries analogous to the family of, of instantons. There's a pseudo modulus, which is I'm calling B, it's, determined, it determines the size of the bottleneck of this geometry. So as the, the geometry pinches off, that's B going to zero. What happens is the action of this wormhole is positive. So these things are exponentially suppressed. And it goes as this parameter B, this bottleneck volume divided by G Newton. So these things are non-perturbed, th these are new instantons in pure Einstein gravity. They're exponentially suppressed. They're non-perturbative configurations, but they're still there. And at least formally, we can uh, write down a, you know, a one-loop approximation to the amplitude over you know, the integral over metrics of this sort, where, well, there's an e to the minus s factor. This would be a one-loop determinant that you get from looking at modes in this background at fixed size. And where there's a, a measure that comes from, you know, properly treating like the, uh, you know, the Wheeler DeWitt measure over metrics. 
And yeah, I guess I I I, I started at ten oh four. So I'll stop here. Um, the the yeah, <laughs> there's a lot more to go. My apologies for for organizing my time so poorly. Um, yeah, I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's thank Christian for. Very nice. So can you give us a brief summary of where you were planning on going after this? Yeah. Um, well, so the, the basic question to my mind is, is are these things, should I, are, are they really there or not? And so one of the things I was, I was going to, to summarize, you know, um, there's things that you can study pretty easily, like are these wormhole stable configurations in gravity? The answer is, is yes in pure Einstein gravity. Um, there's the question of, um, well, how to say, you know, can you use this machinery to say, reproduce known results in 2D and 3D gravity? That's work in progress, but it appears that the answer is yes which I would say is a good kind of experimental test that this, this is this is a reasonable thing to do as long as, again, it's like inserting one. If you do it the right way, then it's the right thing to do. Um, but the, the uh, how to say, though maybe the one interesting thing that I would go from here to say is, I'll, I'll flash a picture maybe for the end. So we embed these wormholes into, we, we study similar wormholes in ADS5 times S5, where there's a spectrum of black holes that you know, starts at the small black hole threshold and then runs off to plus infinity. Um, there's a spectrum of small black holes. It's known um, that you know, small black holes in ADS are perturbatively stable in ADS5, but actually in ADS5 times S5, from the full 10D point of view, there's a gregory Lafalm instability that sets in uh, at sufficiently low mass, whereby SO6 is broken to SO5. So the range of stable black holes is actually here, something like this. And what we find uh, for the these wormholes that we find if they don't carry any spin, so they're spinless, they have the same quantum numbers then as, as black hole microstates, we find superimposed on this picture, well, the, the exact same thing. Um, we find that there's a spectrum of wormholes that carry masses, that carry energies in the same range as those of the small black holes. They're perturbatively stable in ADS5, but there's a Gregory Laflamme like instability in 10 dimensions that appears to be, and we're, this is numerical, and we're, we're still chasing this down, it's tricky, but it appears to be at, this, at the same regime as what one finds for the black holes. So, in other words, the, these wormholes that we're finding, I don't think, you know, they don't seem to have a right to know this. But they know precisely about the, the, the physics of uh, a black hole of small black holes in ADS-5 times S-5. So that, that was my, my, the, my kind of statements I was going to, to build up to, is that there's some agreement between the, the black hole spectrum and the wormhole spectrum. And this would be like a new entry in Euclidean gravity. We're used to the usual one. Black hole thermodynamics is related to Euclidean black holes. But this would be a new one. This would be saying the fluctuations, the, the level statistics of microstates is determined by the wormholes. Question uh, just about the Gregory of the instability. The uh, one way of thinking about it is simply you uplift and then you have this uh, um, uh, stretched object that. Uh, right that now uh, you, there's a competition between um, the, uh, the entropies of uh, lots of beads on the string versus the, yeah. Um, can you naively do the same thing with the wormhole solution and see that it should have the same instability for essentially the same reasons or is it something completely different? It, it's pretty, I mean, it's the same decay channel. It's the same decay channel. Mm -hmm. 
so 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 it, it so that argument does apply that it's essentially i mean it, you, you have to go through the details the details are quite horrendous at least in the way that we've been doing it so far but the the physics of it does seem to be the the same as for um the usual instability okay it's a beating insta it, yeah it's right. a, the, the black hole wants to oblate from the 10d point of view or the wormhole wants to oblate from the 10d yeah. point of view but i just want to clarify because i i thought you were saying that there was a completely different kind of instability that on has an onset at the same place and no, no, it's uh, sorry. I yeah, I, I'm rushing now to. to no, no, it's fine. Uh, what what? So the the instability in ADS of the black hole is kind of like a P wave instability. That's where it first sets in, very close to threshold. It's uh, it's the breaking of of SO six down to SO five. There's certain uh, it's been a, yeah. There's like a, it's something that carries you know L equals one from the point of view of the five sphere. Mm -hmm. And it's just it's pure metric Ramon Ramon phi form fluctuations that that you and that's the same instability channel that we have for for our wormholes. Okay. And please, uh, no no more apologizing for for the structure of the talk. Uh, the, the pedagogical uh, uh, discussion at the beginning was extremely useful. So thank you. Very See nice. how much more there was. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the important one. <laughs> this is a new talk, so I yeah. Well, well I, nice. I, I you know I have a similar problem sometimes where I do uh, uh, a, a blackboard style talk like this, but the, just the way I I then embed it into uh, keynote, and so every every transition, which could mean just an equation gets a term highlighted or something generates a new slide so right. people freak out when i start the talk and they can see you know 148 slides it's like, no it's really only 30 slides it's sort of <laughs> <laughs> so. i think my students have the same problem in my class where i usually have about 120 <laughs> slides but <sighs> yeah anyway no, that was very nice so, so thank you very much i think i'm going to go and feed the feed neat and I will, thanks for the very nice talk. That was that was great. Thank you. So let's thank Kristen one more time. Thank you very much again for the opportunity to speak and to see you guys. Stop the recording.